You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Hello, I'm Maisha Kai, host of the Griot's Writing Black Podcast. In West African tradition, to be a griot is to be a storyteller, one who carries and communicates the experiences and legacies of a people. As the Griot's lifestyle editor, I've always been fascinated by how we tell our stories. That's why we launched Writing Black, to explore the myriad ways Black writers craft stories and communicate our experiences. Thank you for joining us. Here's an excerpt from this week's guest. Uzochi sat on an azure couch, exhaling, (sighs) continuing to zone in on the energy at his center, feeling it fill his heart, head, and limbs. For more than an hour, he'd been planted there, refusing to rise until his body was settled. Staring at the sofa's fabric, its color reminding him of the strange blue light that had continued to reappear in his line of sight since he'd left the fight near school. By the time he'd made it home to Kipps Bay, he was shaking. He'd gone straight up to his apartment, unable to do anything but sit and breathe. And he's been in a lot of things. I'm talking juice, loving basketball, the wood. ER, you may have even seen him most recently on Power, Raising Canaan. That's right. It is the one and only Omar Epps is with us this week. Um, Omar, thank you so much for being on Ready Black. This is so exciting to me. How are thank you? Thank you for having me. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, <laughs> thank you for having me. Oh my God, I'm so tickled. I'm so tickled by this. Like, you know, I think I think I am I think I speak for a uh, a several more than one generation of women to say that this is a this is a a, a moment in time for us. So, <laughs> so don't worry. I will not let that be the crux of our discussion today. But um, you know, I am we created this podcast because we really wanted to talk about the intersection of identity and craft and language and how we use language. And obviously as both an actor and an author, um, you have a unique perspective on how we use language. Um, So I'm really excited to talk to you about that. (laughs) Um, But also, you you know, I don't think a lot of people know you're an author. So you had a book out, uh, Fatherless to Fatherhood. Yeah, from Fatherless to Fatherhood. Which was a really intimate memoir about yeah. your experiences. I think a really relatable one to a lot of people. Yeah. So I do want to talk about that. And also you have an upcoming book, which brings you into another genre. You're, you're, you're delving into the world of like Afrofuturism and a little bit of YA, I believe with Nubia, the awakening. Yeah. Um, yes. How did this project come to you? Like, how did this, I mean, was this always an interest of yours or was it something that has developed recently? Well, to be quite honest with you, I mean, I'm a fan of all genres of um, just art, period, in, in all formats. And uh, you connect where, you know, or when and, when and where you connect. And to be quite honest, uh, the, the the germination of the idea is something that I've had in my head for like over a decade now. And um, when I went on that journey uh, from my memoir, From Fatherless to Fatherhood, when I was promoting it, it was just what blew me away was like, how many people actually still read books because we're in like this digital age. And, you know, I come from the mother, I'm, I'm the son of an educator. And so I read a lot when I was young. Mm -hmm. And so in the back of my mind, I was wondering like, man, I wonder if kids still like avidly read books. And so we were at this book convention at um, the Jacob Javis center. um, And there's, there were like hundreds of kids lined up, you know, on this one line. And I was like, well, what's that for? And they were like, oh, that's a young adult sci-fi. That, I forget the author's name, forgive me, but they, they're like huge in the space. And the people I was with were like explaining to me, like, you know, they're a rock star, these kids. And I was like blown away, like, wow, kids still read books. And so when I went to the hotel that night, it was the light bulb moment, you know, of Nubia, The Awakening. I, I, like I said, it'd been sitting in my head and it was just something, a voice was tapping me on the shoulder and said, hey, it's time to um, unearth this and, and, and figure it out because there is an audience for it and they they are rabid, they're dedicated, they're they're loyal. You know, I didn't I didn't know that, you know, in this particular format. So it was a three and a half year journey 
um, to, to write the book. Um, my co-author is uh, Clarence A. Haynes, who's, who's a rock star himself. Um, and with Penguin Random House, Delacorte, you know, it's, it's just been an amazing experience so far because people really believe in the project and the vision. And, you know, the topics that sort of are the underbelly um, of the book. Uh, people are really, the, the, the advanced reads, the response has been phenomenal. Um, because I've really tried to weave, a, it's this sort of magical, there's that, you know, fantastical element, but it's really rooted in some deep truths and deep questions mm-hmm. about, you know, why we are, how we are, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. to your point earlier, when you talk about the use of words and things of that nature. And, and I tried to take that sort of nugget and really unpack it and peel back the layers of the onion, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I think exactly what you just said is exactly why um, we created this podcast. Like, you know, when you talk about bringing identity to the fore, and and we have seen this huge surge in the YA market in, I would say, the last five to 10 years. Um, But I totally agree with you. I think it's what we've learned um, thus far from these narratives. It's impossible, obviously, to talk about the future without some context of the past. And mm-hmm. I think that's what makes um, fantastical literature from our demographic that much more intriguing, frankly. Right. You know, right. I like I think that's a, I think that's a great thought. And, um, you know, as black and brown people, if you will, you know, it, it's a really it's a really interesting thing um, in terms of um us in general, but specifically the youth demographic, the teen demographic, because as we grow and evolve through life, we realize that we have to unlearn uh, skewed narratives that we were just taught in school, you know, Christopher Columbus discovered America and all, you know, and one after the other, after the other, which is all not true. (laughs) And if you don't seek out the real information, the truth of the information um, then you'll just go off for some someone else's narrative that's actually untrue. And so I find that specifically in our communities, um, because especially when you go abroad, when you go abroad and you travel across the world, it's like every other culture is learning the real truth. Right. You know, we're the ones that have it misconstrued and it's not to a fault of our own. Right. So with with um with a book like Nubia the Awakening, I'm I'm trying to tap into that in subtle ways, right? Kind of like um, put, put the castor oil on top of some pancakes and then put some syrup on that, you know? <laughs> you know? So it's, still, so it's still entertaining, but, you know, after the reader, especially a young reader, reads the book, you know, they're going to walk away with some questions mm-hmm. about certain things in, in, in life. And, and I was very, in, I was intentful um, with writing it for a younger demographic, because that's when the mind is still, it's not, I'm not, I'm not even talking about development. You just, it's just a sponge. Yes, it's just soaking it's open, in information. It's pliable. And, I totally hear you. I used to teach that, that exactly. age group. So I get it. Yeah. <laughs> totally yeah. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like dropping some seeds in there. And, and also, you know, it correlates to a, a lot of what's, though, though the book takes place basically a hundred years from now, a lot of the overarching themes, if you will, in the book, they correlate to certain things now, or at least that's how I try to execute it. Yeah. So that the message at the end that the reader gets is like, wow, this, this kind of, you know, feels like now. Yeah. I mean, we've seen that happen, you know, I mean, whether it's somebody, whether it's an author who's writing now, or, you know, we've seen this recently, like a lot of people got really interested in in Octavia Butler for the first time in the last few years, Mm -hmm. because, all the sudden things that she was writing, like in her like parable trilogy, were all of a sudden so prescient and so relevant. And, you know, these are books I read in real time, you know, that <laughs> I was like, oh, my gosh, you're totally right. You know, I loved what you were saying about the YA audience and how pliable they are. Jason Reynolds, who, you know, incredible YA writer, has done tons of books. I remember asking him at one point, we had a conversation. I asked him, like, so why? you know, why, why children's books, essentially, why YA books? He's like, well, you know, people always like kind of poo-poo this, like, 
you're somehow like copping out if you write for a children's audience. He's like, they're the, they're the, both the best and the hardest demographic to write for, <laughs> you know, yep. because yep. you, A, you have to get it right. But also they're the best audience, like what better audience than one that to your point is so open and so fluid. Um, and, and I don't want to say pliable because I think to your point, like, I, I think that's, that's more on the parents, right. You know, but in terms of what they're able to absorb and, and consider, I, I yeah. think is, is important. And adjust yes. and, and adjust the, yes. the younger, the younger crowd, they adjust on the fly. They just deal with life as it comes because they don't have the weight of so many responsibilities on their shoulders just yet. Because as those things come along, it can harden your mind, you know, right? because you got to punch that clock. I, I got to put food on the table and you just sort of get stringent with, 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 with the mind. Whereas, you know, a young person can, you know, they change their favorite color tomorrow and it's, it's OK, especially this generation now. They're so interconnected, mm -hmm. you know, I look at it, I look at that part of it as a gift, you know, the fact that if I was like 13, you know how when we were kids, they had like pen pals and you just <laughs> yes. sort of write somebody <laughs> randomly and then they might write you back or exchange programs, stuff like that. I think it's very, very powerful for this generation to now, I'm just using this as a, as a ruse, but like, you know, they may watch something on the news, right? And it's like, this is happening in this place. But they may be they may have a, a Twitter or Instagram friend that's actually boots on the ground in that place. And they're able to get in real time. No, this is actually what's going on. So it's hard to hide the, the information and it's hard to misinform this generation. And I think that down the line, that's a massive gift because it's going to it's going to it's going to knock down these barriers that we have, uh, whether it's ethnicity, uh, socioeconomics and or just the idea of. The tribalism, right? Yeah. There's always going to be that element of human life, right? You know, I'm from New York. I like the Yankees. Oh, you're from Philly. You like the red. Like the, that, we'll always have that part of it. But at least that's, there's an innocence to that because it's just competition, right? Mm -hmm. But in the minutia of actual life, you know, that's part of why I based the book out of New York as well. Um, New York is sort of the other character. Um, not biased because I was born and raised here, yeah. but strategically it's okay if you're because biased, that's fine if that's <laughs> no no but, I, but i'm not biased because there's there's beautiful places but listen i lived in new york, york for over 20 years i'm biased and i still think of it as well. no, so, <laughs> get it it's well, well well i'll say i'll say the old new york that i come yes from. it's totally it, different it, from no this, you are this new york looks like tokyo you or something. are absolutely correct about that sir you are you are yes but 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 there was i only brought that up because there was an honesty to people back then mm -hmm. that i think that was that was very pure, right? Right, and there were so many different cultures, and every culture had their little pocket. So, and then you all got to smash together like sardines in a can on the train, right? And you might be standing next to whether the dude's a white dude from Wall Street who's worth like ten million dollars, or you know the Chinese dude up the block, or the Russian dude around the corner, or the Jewish woman down the block, or at the deli, and it, you just all of these different cultures, the Latinos, the 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 Caribbean, uh, you know, blacks, uh, black people, like we're all living in this sort of condensed space. So it forced you, or at least it forced me to one, have an interest in other ways of life right. and other ways of thinking. Right. And especially through food, you know, like the first time I had Middle Eastern food, I was a little kid, you know, and I would sit in, sit in the stores with these guys and, you know, they would have pictures of, you know, their brothers or their family, like right at the window. And, you know, you, you get talking to them. These are people you talk to every day and they tell you stories about their life coming up that seem so far fetched. But with everything we've gone through as a, as a, not only a culture, a society now, it's like, you, you know, you just sort of gain a respect for other ways of living. Yeah. Like there's space for, for us all. And the whole point is, and this goes back to Nubia. The, the the biggest message I want the reader to take away is the idea of unity and what it really means in actuality. Yeah, you know, and I, I will say that your New York experience, even you as a native and me as a transplant, parallel each other very closely. So uh, I totally relate to a lot of that. I also think about the fact that you are entering the YA market at a juncture in which we're also facing the whole like backlash against, you know, 
anything that even remotely resembles CRT. And I, I say that the way I say it because I'm, CRT is not taught in elementary schools or junior highs or, you know, what have you. But um, we're seeing, you know, more and more like book bannings and, you know, just people trying to deny the truths, the facts, the just, you know, honesty of other people's existences. And it's so interesting to me that that's how you framed that. Because I, I think to myself, what an interesting time to be entering that market when those very ideas, the idea of, of exalting what's different or saying how what's different is vilified is being attacked. Yeah. And, and we've, but we've been through this before, yes, you know, have. cause I'm, I'm, I, I'm saying this humbly, but I'm like low key, a, a low key historian. But, I love it. Uh, I'm a couch, I'm a couch historian, <laughs> but I only say, I only say that to say that when you study history, I'm talking about thousands of years, all they're doing is, you know, copying and pasting, mm-hmm. copying and pasting the same, you and know, revisi- the same revising the story ideas. to fit. It's, I mean, that's what they're doing. Yes. Revising is yes. revisionist history. Yeah. I mean, even I don't, I don't want to go off on a tangent. We'll stick to Nubia, but I'm just to, just to, to sort of put a button on this issue. Even when you look at let's go back a few years ago and look at what ISIS was doing. They were destroying libraries. They were destroying structures that it stood for thousands of years. So in essence, they were trying to destroy history, actual history, mm-hmm. scrolls that had been around for thousands of years that people could go see and touch. And then in American culture, what we don't realize is when you go to a museum, all of that stuff was pilfered from other lands. Mm-hmm. This ain't ours. These are stolen goods that they put on display and then charge you to go see. So how that comes back to Nubia is, OK, well, I want to be in the future. What's it going to look like if not? It's not a, it's not about being morbid. It's about being realistic. Mm-hmm. So what if what if we don't change our way of living as human society? And all of these cataclysms, climate change, and all these things actually take place. Then what does the world look like? You know, I think you, and on multiple layers. So like Nubia, it, the, the, the mythology of it is that Nubia was a utopian society. It was its own island nation off the coast of Africa. The men and women there lived in perfect harmony with the land, so much so that each individual was bestowed with a mystical power. Then everyone was different. Um, and and that was came, a good thing. Climate, <laughs> and that was a, it was a great thing because everything was in total balance. They lived in total balance with their environment. Mm. There, was, there was no crime. There was uh, no poverty. There was none of that. And, you know, along with climate change came war across the global war and and Nubia is destroyed. And so now the the Nubians become refugees and they've all settled here in what New York would be in a uh, hundred years from now. You know, half of the city is basically underwater, mm-hmm. starting at the lower tip. And, and that's where all the poor people live in the swamp. Um, the rich, high and mighty, they live more towards uptown or midtown, which is what we're calling the up high. And not only are they, they have all the, the wealth and, you know, if you could picture a building twice as tall as three times as tall as the World Trade Center or something like that. Um, they I also can picture have it. I think huge, it's at Central Park South. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But they've, they've also fused technology into the body. Mm-hmm. So they live a completely different mm-hmm. existence. And so our main characters are Uzochi, who represents love. Uh, Lencho, who sort of represents hate, and Zuberi, who's sort of the gray area in between. Zuberi's our female. She's a, okay. a warrior. Her father's a warrior. She just, you know, she stands on her square. She stands for truth and justice. Lencho is sort of our uh, revolutionary. He's he's um, uh, he's our revolutionary. He's he's about preserving the integrity of Nubian people and. Uzochi is, is, is the awkward teenager. He's just the awkward, you know, being a teenager is a very awkward stage of life because you think you know it all, but you know, you don't know it all and you still have to live other, right. un, under other right. people's You're rules old enough and to things know of that, that nature. You need autonomy, but you don't necessarily know enough to have your own fully formed ideas. Absolutely. That. Yeah. Right. And so, and so the, the legend of 
the true Nubian history because their parents had to scatter and, you know, live in this sort of, basically they, they would displace um, and they're just trying to get by all of their, all of their parents' generations. They no longer have powers. They no longer have that magic. And they think it's been destroyed with their native land. And you have this, 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 these sort of motley crew of teenagers, these Nubians, they're all around the same age, like adolescents. And it's like these, these mythical powers start to sprout in each of them and they don't know what it is. So they're thinking they're like the weirdos, but they don't know like, no, this is like real because their parents never right. explained this. Right, and this is your legacy yet. as well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So okay. it's kind of like dealing with stuff like that. You know, it's, it's, it's dealing with... Um, like I just said, like displacement and still with socioeconomic issues. I brought up that word tribal on purpose because, you know, the people who are here prior to them coming, they think they're coming in to take over. So they're, they have their own tribes, if Mm -hmm. you will, and, or the feeling of a gang to protect their turf, you know? And, you know, obviously those sides are going to, are going to clash and obviously, there's a lot of twists and turns and, and sort of um, shapeshifters, if you will, in terms of other characters who seem like they're down for one thing, but they really have an ulterior motive behind other things. And it's really fun. It's a really fun read. And I think that, you know, it's something you can really sink your teeth into because there's just so many issues that correlate to now that I think about it in a way of like, it's like when, when we see some of this stuff on television that we've seen in the last couple of years, mm-hmm. it takes me back to being a kid. Well, I, we had a black and white TV until I was 16. So I remember watching like old footage of like the riots yeah. from like the 50s and the 60s and stuff. To watch something on screen is one thing to see dogs being right. sick on right. people, human right. beings, little girls and boys and they're sick and dog and they have the fire hoses on them and they're just beating them. You know, when I was watching that as a kid, I, I mean, who could wrap their mind around that? But I was so infuriated, but at the same time I was motivated. So I'd say that to say, let's skip forward to now. You know, when you watch things like Ferguson and, and all these things and you're like, it's, it's so interesting how the universe has a mathematic equation for any, for everything. So follow what I'm saying. Jo- had we not been, in a pandemic, in the lockdown, the George Floyd thing, it would have just been another thing that happened that locally they probably would have heard about. But the national uproar was only because everyone was stuck in the house and they had to be, they had to be forced to watch. And this is how this parallels back to the past. You know who doesn't get enough credit for being a hero? Like a shiro is Emmett Till's mother. To have the courage all the way back then to say, no, show his face in the papers because everybody that reads the paper is going to be forced yeah. to see what they did yep. to my son. And, pe- and it horrified people. Yeah, I mean, people don't believe what they can't see. Stay tuned for more from the Writing Black Podcast. The Griot Star Stories with Tere, coming soon on the Griot's Black Podcast Network. Welcome back to the Writing Black Podcast. And I'm also, you know, really fascinated by when you fell in love with words. Um, Because, Mm -hmm. you know, like most of us of my generation, our generation, you know, might have become familiar with you, I don't know, around 1992 with Juice. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But I I do, Mm -hmm. I do, you know, my producer has surfed the internet. We found out that you were actually also a wordsmith prior to Juice, having been in the Wolf Pack. Um, Can you tell me about like how words became another vehicle for you before or maybe at the same time as acting? Because we all know you as an actor and you're a brilliant actor, but like what else, what else happened there? Thank you. Well, I'll tell you for me, I've I've just been inspired by the artists um, who inspired me. Um, and I say that to say, for, you know, for me, acting became an extension of writing. You know, I've been writing poetry since I was like eight. You know, I've been reading Langston Hughes and James Baldwin and Maya Angelou and so forth and so on since I was 
like a little kid, you know, and I was just so, you know, I was just so captured by, I was captured by, you know, how certain artists, I call them, but we say individuals can express themselves um, through word. Um, even when you think about someone like Nina Simone, it's just how, how, like, you know, I would have these questions like, why is that being said that way? And then you have like, the, then you get into the entendre world where it's like, you're saying one thing, but you're also saying this at the same time in this very same mm-hmm. phrase, mm-hmm. you know? I think um, as of now, uh, Sean Carter, Sean Jay-Z Carter is a master at that. Um, you know, so things like that. And, I, and like I said, I always wrote poetry and then I got into rapping and everything like that. And and I would read a lot. And, and um, you know, once I saw Sidney Poitier on television, I was like, I want to do that, <laughs> you know, but understanding how to convey um, feelings and emotions and thoughts um, through word, um, through the format of acting became of interest to me. Um, because I, I, um, I actually, one of my secrets, I can say this now, but I actually always try to find a way to emote without saying something, you know, but, you know, and, and I'm very, very, um, uh, I'm hands on with my eyes, with the audience. I always want them to see something else going on in this character, but this character is its own universe. We're, we're all our own universes, you know? I, I, I don't know what you've gone through in your life, all of the minutia of it, same for you to me, you know? So it's like that thing where, what's that feeling that we have when we know someone for some time and like, you feeling, you feeling mm-hmm. right today? Mm-hmm. They're like, yeah, yeah, I'm cool. And you know they're not. That's, to me, that's magic. Because you know it, you feel it, though it might not be, it's not being said in dialogue at that time. So it's like, when you take something like that, and, and I was fortunate, um, and mind you, I did put in the work, study the craft. Uh, I still am studying the craft because um, I love it. I love that you say but, that because you know, it's an fortunate ongoing, to start it's off an so ongoing early. process, any craft, right? I love that you say that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's art. Art has no expiration date. That's mm-hmm. the beauty of it. It's not like it's athletics. Like one day your knee's going to give out and you can't jump so high. You can't run so right. fast. You know, some of the greatest art is delivered, you know, when someone's in their 70s or 80s. They have a whole different perspective of life at that point, <laughs> you know. So it's it's a, it's a to me, it's like an infinite medium. I mean, um, with what we can leave behind as artists, whether you're a painter, whether you're, you know, Alan Ailey, or, you know, whatever medium it is. Um, we have the the ability to transcend time through our art. And that's powerful to me. I mean, it's powerful to me as well. And it's powerful to hear you say it. Um, And I think also, you know, this through line of of words, I love that. I love the way that you talked about, you know, moving from poetry into another medium, but it's all kind of the same thing. Because I I agree with you as somebody who has worked in many mediums myself, that it always came back to storytelling and, and what, um, the power of being able to do that. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, James Baldwin and Langston Hughes and like my Angelou, like who do you turn to whether, and listen, it could be, you're listening to them. So maybe it's Jay-Z, maybe it's, you know, um, who do you, who do you turn to when you're looking, when you think of someone who, conveys messages in a way that like really resonates with you? Um, that's a, I know uh, it's a big, I know that's it's a, a big long question. List. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a very, very big question. That's, that's one of those, uh, I got to ponder. <laughs> um, no, but you know what? I, I, I will, I'll, I'll mm-hmm. go with Jay, you know, um, I'll go with Jay for now because of, not only what he says and how he says it, but how he's living as a human being, you know, and how he is, we don't even know the power of how someone like that is inspiring the generations coming after on, on, on a multitude of levels, especially when it comes to being black and brown in the world, 
specifically in this country. You know, it's a, it's, you know, hip hop, um, you know, think about the jazz musicians Mm -hmm. that was hip hop, you know, and then you go before that and you go before that and it comes right back to Africa, comes right back to the motherland. We, which we have our, our tribes, we have our rituals, the, the girl is coming of age, the boy is coming of age. We do certain dances for a reason. We beat the drum for a reason. Everything ha- is for a reason. We were the scientists. We were the ones doing the first surgeries. We were the ones who cultivated the land and learned how to sustain it and mm. irrigate the land. We were the ones that that's been stolen from us. So, so much to the point of where, if you follow me for a second, you know, you'll save up all this money. You'll either save the money or you go steal the money to buy a pair of $1,500 sneakers with some French name on it. Meanwhile, you got a dude over here who may be of your own, who's making the same quality of sneaker with a deeper meaning, but you don't, you know, but yeah, but that's that. That all comes from our history being mm-hmm. stolen from us. And so we have to, I don't, we have to imbue the younger generation with the true mm-hmm. worth of their value of our value, of what we've contributed to this world, not just this country. We got to go past the narratives of, oh, we black, we built America. Yeah, no, we built the world. How about that? You know what I mean? And we, and it, literally, let's study history. Let's study the facts. So we should be able to have these conversations. When I see the way that the world, the, the, the way that American society is right now, it can be off-putting. But as I said before, there's a gift within all of this for young people because they ain't trying to go through what we're going through right now. That's not the way that they see the world. They see the world. They're experiencing the world in a completely different way. And so I think that we're at, I guess the right word would be an impasse, right, Um, of how we're going to move forward. And it's like to me, let's think about technology it's like the design of our society needs a firmware update, not a software update. <laughs> what we're doing right now is software updates. We need so a firmware update. So you're saying we should just turn it off risk, and put and it in some have... rice? <laughs> no, I'm not saying turn it off and put it in some rice. I'm saying, you know, you can do a software <laughs> update can, on your you data can. plan. Yes. The, the firmware update, you got to be connected to Wi-Fi. You want to jailbreak the whole thing. You just want to like... I'm not saying wanna, jail I'm trying to get the lingo. Break. I'm saying <laughs> okay, firmware okay, update. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying firmware okay. update. I'm using those words intentionally yes. because it's you know once you okay. here's a, here's the conundrum. Once you control the person's idea, you have them. You can control their perception of all things. The conundrum to that is you can't control anybody's idea. Period. Something similar may have been thought about before. Like they say, there's nothing new under the sun, but who thought of a phone with no buttons on it at a time where they were looking at jobs like, what are you, crazy? But then you have to dig into that history. He, he patented that 20 years prior. Or you look at someone like George Lucas, for instance, the Star Wars, they developed technology. He had to wait to make certain films because they didn't have the technology to pull off his ideas. So, the, you know, when I think about whether well, it's 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, obviously in Nubia, The Awakening, when I think about the book, what does it look right. like 100 years from now? Right. Well, what can it look like? And what are the positives? You know, like they say, we got to go through the darkness before we get to the light. So ultimately, at the, at the end of not only this book, but just the story itself is there. It's bigger than there's a light at the end of the tunnel. The light is starting to emit from within. I think you're right. I think it's out of necessity. And I I think to your point, like there's an incredible opportunity there. Um, And and I am totally with you in terms of everything happens for a reason. And this era that we're in is happening for a reason. Um, So you, we know you from the screen saying other people's words. And we know you now on the page saying your words. Will we see you transitioning to screenwriting or bringing this 
narrative to the screen? Is that something that you have in mind or are you just letting it breathe for now? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. No, no. Well, okay. from your lips to God's ears. I mean, that that okay. is the ultimate plan. And I have been uh, quietly, you know, writing and, and producing um, uh, for at least the last decade. Just, at least just 10 getting years, better yes. and better. And, <laughs> okay. and, um, yes. Yeah, it's a it's a tough, you know, yeah. it's, a, it's a tough business. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, as many um, as many uh, incredible young black and brown female filmmakers um, that I've been around um, that are producing amazing work, you know, it was only one Black Panther. That's the problem, you know. It's not. I mean, yeah, that Black Panther deserved everything and more, but there should be a hundred more of them. I do. <laughs> you see what yeah. I'm saying? So I hope to I hope to contribute to that um, that resilience and um, stamina that an artist needs because everybody's going to get their chance. This is what I tell young kids when I speak to them. Everybody's going to get a chance somehow, some way. The thing is to sustain mm. is the hard part. You know, you might get a chance to be in some movie, or you might get a chance to put out some song. Or, might get a chance to, you know, write a book and it's this big splash. Right. But then what? So we have to prepare for success in that way. We have to prepare for it, you know? And you can see the difference between people who do and people who don't, you know? Um, and I think the younger generation just, uh, I'm really excited for them because I actually, you know, my kids are 23, 18, and 14. And I think about, I mean, my 23 year old is kind of the last of the Mohicans. Like she remembers the world with no social media <laughs> and stuff like that, you know. And we had to go through that with her little sister because she was like, why didn't, why could she get a phone? I, I was 13. I wanted a phone. And it was like, but it was a different time. Like now it's like, we, it's out of fear. Like we need to, you know, if something happens, we need to be mm-hmm. able to get in touch with you, you know. And, um, you know, and I look at my son, you know, he's a 14 year old kid. And I try to imagine myself being 14, you know. In the world now, it's like kind of scary to me. Because as I say, the time that I grew up in, I mean, things were just so honest. There weren't cameras everywhere. There was no people talk to people. You know, if you if you were a young person interested in another young person, like for me being a male, if I'd seen a young female, you had to know how to approach her and have social interaction and talk with her and make her laugh and, you know. And these kids now, it's just, you know, Everything is this. Da, 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 da. It's the trippiest thing. They're like going inside a restaurant and everybody, four people at a table. Their phones. Like I know. This. I know. It's wild. <laughs> it's wild. It's, it's strange, but but there's something to that um, where I always I always try to see. Well, I, I don't try. I always try to I try to see the silver lining, but I look at life through the lens of an artist. Like every single thing to me is there's a mm-hmm. there's an art to it. There's something there to be um, that will enrich mm. me. It's kind of how I look at, you know, the world. And they always say, like, the most valuable thing in this world is, oh, it's love. And it's, I'm like, eh, yeah, love is very important. But time is the most valuable thing in the world. Because you can choose to fall out of love with somebody or you could love somebody and don't even like them, you know. But think about that. Like when it comes to family, like you love them because that's your family, but Fair. you don't want to hang out with them every day. You don't have a choice in time. Yeah. Like this time that we're spending together that's right now, we'll never be able to get it back. And so I say that intentionally to say we, that's why when we say you need to make the best of our time, that's the truth. And we have every millisecond to do so, to grow, to evolve, to get better um, in the ways that we can. And a big part of that is, how are we treating one another? How are we affecting one another? How are we affecting one another? You know, as, you know, every tribe has its place. You know, whatever, whatever you believe in, if you're a believer in, in, in a higher power, if you're not, certainly there's a vast thing in between that is sort of unexplainable, right, to, to a lot of people. And, in, you know, again, kind of bringing it back to Nubia, unpacking some of what that could look like, you know, and, and sort of letting the reader define it by their own means. 
instead of trying to um, doctrinate them with what I think it sh- they should think, you know, it's sort of more posing questions. And again, I go back to the beginning of the conversation. Like we we spend time not just as, as black and brown people, but I think just as human beings. Um, I posted something this morning, and I think I'm going to post. I'm going to sort of give a a, 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 a a counter post to it probably tomorrow. But I posted something about you know a, a, if a man has a, a good woman by his side who's pushing him to be his better self and so forth and so on, like honor and cherish her. Because that's the best way for you to live in gratitude to the Almighty, whatever you believe in. But I want to counter that with the same thing for females. You know what I mean? And now we're in this uh, sort of pronoun acronym world. Everything is, everyone is so sensitive. But at the end of the day, the sun is the sun and the moon is the moon and the clouds are clouds and the sky is blue right now. Like it is what it is. We can't be in that middle space of, you know, we, life is life. And we have to, that's why we have to uh, embrace it. And, and kids, it's sort of, it's so cliche, but it's not cliche. It's just the truth. Kids are the future. I Me hope not. Be Gosh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope not. I think- Listen, you I know, I, I think that, I think there, that there, there are definitely points there. And I think that, you know, in terms of, um, the fulfillment that we find, the fulfillment that we hope that a younger generation finds. I hope they find it, but I hope they find it first in themselves, but I hope they appreciate it when they find it in others for sure. But I also, you talked about time and I appreciate the time that you've given us <laughs> like for this, you know, you get, you've spoken so freely and so candidly. And I don't know that everybody does that. And I do really appreciate that because I think um, we are obviously at a juncture where we're lacking that kind of candor and that kind of honesty and, and um, where we're in need of a lot of vulnerability, I think um, in terms of how we're approaching the world and, how the world is approaching us. So, uh, right. Omar Epps, I... The world is going to be fine. This, the world is going to be fine. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> look look at what you happened during right. the pandemic. You're right, you're right. What happened? You are right. The air cleared up. It's all animals coming out in places like, we could go. <laughs> we could go out again? Finally, they're gone. You're right. So you're right. The, the human species, we, we might have some things to work out, but you're right. The, the, the world is going to resolve itself. Um, right. Yeah. No, I just really appreciate you being here. And, and especially, you know, I think you and your presence, you have so much meaning to our audience and to generations. Because I was just watching Raising Canaan yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> people. So right. thank you so much, Omar Epps. And thank you for this book. Uh, Nubia, The Awakening will be out this fall. We are very excited. Um, that's right. Pre-orders that's well right. Everyone books are sold, books are sold. And I will be digging yeah. into it soon because I know y'all going to send me one. <laughs> so thank you for, for explaining yeah. that to me. We and thank you. you for celebrating Nubians. Because, you know, we out here, <laughs> as they say. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, share. <laughs> Thank you so oh, much. I appreciate, appreciate you guys you. so much. Thank you. So if you're like me, Omar Epps represents one of your favorite times in your life. <laughs> so it's a perfect time to talk about my favorites, which are books and readings and listenings and watchings, viewings, watchings, whatever, viewings uh, that I like to recommend uh, that relate to our discussions each week. And this week, I think, Omar did such an incredible job of discussing Afrofuturism and particularly how it relates to our past. And another author who is incredible at doing that is um, N.K. Jemisin. Uh, I highly recommend, you know, The City We Became is an excellent entree. One of my favorite descriptions is this one from uh, a fellow author, Neil Gaiman. It's a glorious fantasy set in that most imaginary of cities, New York. And considering our discussion with Omar, I think that that's kind of a perfect companion piece for you to read because having been a New Yorker myself, it, it is a little surreal. I'm like, you know, are we in the past? Are we in the future? Are we in the whatever? In Disneyland? We don't know. Um, I also, honestly, I, and I say this because I, I've seen a lot of debates about this online, you know, um, over the past year or two. Uh, I am a huge Lovecraft country fan. And I think like, I got to a point where I was like, if you get it, you get it. And if you don't, you don't. And I understand that everybody wants to see some of the more abject horrors of our history. And some of us, you know, 
Um, just don't get it. Um, and some of us just don't like it. And that's actually okay too. But if you are into understanding how Afrofuturism and actual African-American history fit together, I think, you know, get your little viewing party going on at HBO Max with Lovecraft Country. And I think like Misha Green, just like she did with Underground, did an excellent job of kind of um, melding, dovetailing, comparing, paralleling, whatever you, word you want to use, these two eras. Um, and letting us know that, as Omar said, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Writing Black. As always, you can find us on the Grio app or wherever you find your podcasts. The Grio Black Podcast Network is here and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the Black perspective. Ready for real talk and Black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Grio mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard.